All right, so this is a follow-up to my other video talking about our solar system that we were putting in. This is the system installed. This is our solar array we're looking at. It's about uh, 10 in the morning, near the end of December. So it's one of the worst times of the year in terms of uh, uh, solar coverage, um, sun angle. But we're pretty well uh, getting a good dose of solar right now. These are our two midnight solar combiner boxes. This is where the solar panels all come together. We have two arrays, uh, two solar arrays uh, consisting of 15 panels each for a total of 30 panels. Uh, each array consists of a set of three wired in series, actually well, five sets of three wired in series, and then the five sets uh, wired in parallel. So each series set comes back to one of these combiner boxes, and then there are five breakers in each of these boxes, and they are combined at that point uh, in par into parallel, and there are, there's a positive and negative and a ground going from each of those combiner boxes down to a charge controller. And so, again, ten sets of three total, um, so we have two arrays. And the way we have them wired, they're supposed to be relatively consistent in terms of solar. So we actually have the first five here in an array. And then the very back one there, as well as these four in another array. Because that's uh, generally, I think, the best in terms of uh, consistent uh, solar coverage. So we live in a very wooded environment. We're back in the woods. Um, fortunately, most of the area to our south we ended up clearing in order to build the house. So we have most of our opening to the south. That said, uh, we've got a series of poplar trees here to our west. And we have a big maple right there that's going to have to probably come down. It actually needs to come down anyway because it's, uh, it's dying from the construction work. Uh, we, I was kind of waiting to see if it made it. but. Uh, it's going to affect our solar production for, um, you know, the, well, during the winter more than I would like. So we'll probably need to take it down anyway. We may trim or take down one of, like, that maple on the right there. Um, we'll have to see how it goes, but I think uh, generally our coverage is going to be pretty good. I'm shooting for, you know, four to five hours a day of good direct solar, and I think we're going to... Uh, actually end up exceeding that certainly in the I mean in the winter right now actually we calculated we're gonna exceed that now um, at the end of December which is about the worst time December 21st is the winter solstice and so uh, in the summer obviously we're gonna have much much more direct Sun from above uh, we're gonna have oh, probably probably twice as much um, coverage and since this is a grid tie system um, that excess goes back to our power company um, spins our meter backwards, so um, you know we make up for the consumption that we save in the day, or the the generation we make in the day. We use obviously to power the home during the day, as well as go back into the grid, and then it comes back into our home at night. But we don't pay for it because we're offsetting it by our production during the day. So that works out really well. So we ended up using tilt legs on ours. I don't have the roof completely cleaned off yet. We just finally got everything mounted uh, to the way we uh, wanted it yesterday. Each of these panels is roughly a 13 degree angle. Kind of gives us the best. Uh, I put the arrays obviously on the north end of our roof to uh, maximize solar exposure from the south. And uh, so the 13 degree angle ends up being the kind of the happy medium to prevent shading issues on the panels behind them, behind the other panels, as well as um, obviously tilting it up to get a little bit better uh, solar exposure um, for the winter when the sun is low in the sky. These are these midnight solar SPD surge protection devices, which are rated for uh, Actually, they start clamping voltage at 300 volts, sending it to ground to protect uh, from a lightning strike to protect the equipment downstairs, anything from this point on. And obviously, 
we've grounded every all of these panels and uh, connected them all to ground as well. So here's our new uh, electric meter, net meter that was installed by our utility company, and also the solar disconnect that we added so that they could uh, shut off the solar generation if they needed to for some reason. And here's our 11 kilowatt Generac generator that's also tied into the system. Our heat pump, which works very, very well. And then let's have a look here. So this is a digital meter, but as you can see, it's going backwards. That arrow flashing to the left indicates that we're sending power back to the utility company. When we're consuming power, it flashes, the right arrow flashes. Pretty cool. It's also one of the new cool smart meters that uh, allows them if they want, if they have the uh, mesh network established, to be able to read the meter remotely without sending someone. So, so far so good. I really like the smart meter. I don't know, uh, I know there's a controversy about them. I don't get it. Um, it seems to be focused around RF radiation, but if they're worried about the little uh, bursts that these things send out, <laughs> they need to go uh, dig a hole uh, because that's nothing compared to the cell phones and everything else that people are exposed to in terms of RF radiation. Now I'm inside. This is our Outback Radian system. The electrician had his hands full. That's our FRG energy monitor we're using now. There are two charge controllers, as I said. The, uh, Two arrays come into these individual charge controllers. So let's take a look here. One array is currently producing 96 volts and 13.3 amps. And then the output below that is going down to the battery bank, which is actually being utilized by the inverters right now. <clears throat> and it's 54.5 volts at 21 amps. And then this other array is producing currently looks like 82 volts at 15 amps outputting 54 volts at 23 amps so it's currently producing 1.2 kilowatts that other one is producing 1.15 kilowatts currently and it has today thus far produced 1.2 kilowatt hours this one has produced 1.7 kilowatt hours They're in grid time mode so you can hear the inverters in there humming there's two inverters in this top box and the bottom box is actually a uh, essentially a, com a breaker box, load box. That's the uh, battery connection on the right, PV on the bottom left, and then the uh, AC connectivity where it all ties back in on the upper left. So this is our main panel that came with the house, 200 amp panel, breaker box, and then I have. So obviously we've got the 200 amp main disconnect here, service disconnect, and these are blanker, blanks put in when we re removed the uh, other breakers. So there's the inverter breaker, that's a 50 amp breaker that actually goes to the inverter. The power that we're currently selling to the utility company goes back through that, so that's actually bi-directional, it can go either way. When we're bringing power in from the grid, it goes through that to the inverter, and when we're selling it, it goes, goes back out. The top left is the connection to the critical panel critical load panel which is right here I'll get into in a second 100 amp and then the second one is the connection to the switchable panel which is over here switchable load panel and then below that these are the loads like our electric tankless water heater that I never plan to run off grid because they can't they're too they're too they draw too much power that's 27,000 watt system that tankless water here and as well as the furnace heat strip which is a 60 amp breaker and uh, we had two heat strips one of them was connected in the same circuit as the blower we actually moved that to the switchable load panel and then this one we left in place uh, because it's one it's it's one of the heat strips and those heat strips are only used when the heat pump um, is in defrost mode basically or, or it's too cold and it can't do, do the job so this this is only utilized uh, when we have grid connectivity
and we have the other heat strip disconnected, the one that's tied to the, uh, the blower so that we can run it uh, off grid. This is another one of those SPD, the surge protection device. This actually is connected in parallel right where the utility power comes in. So if there's a major lightning surge, it, uh, it basically shunts that to ground and protects our home or an EMP that, that comes in from the grid. And so this is our critical load panel on the right, what I'm calling critical load panel, which basically is always run through the inverter. There's a, an, a generator inter interlock connector here, which basically prevents you from keep having both of these on simultaneously because that would be very bad. It would back feed. So this prevents you from doing that. So right now this is running through the inverter. So if we're using power from the utility for this box, it goes from that other um, 50 amp breaker I showed you over to the inverter and then back into this panel uh, for these loads through that one right there. If I wanted to, I could switch this to the grid by flipping that on and this one off. And then, so these are our, our loads that uh, are basically the, the non-large uh, loads, the smaller loads in the home for pretty much everything. And this is our switchable load panel. Same setup over here. If I want to, we can run this off the grid. Um, well, actually right now it is running off the grid. Or we can run it off the inverter, off grid if we need to. Uh, we obviously have to be cognizant of the loads when we do that because these are some of the larger loads. Um, we've got, well, the septic pump, that's not a real large load, but we've got the heat pump water heater, the uh, heat pump air conditioner, dryer, house fan, furnace blower, stove, uh, oven, microwave, things like that. So under normal circumstances, this one will remain on the grid uh, unless the power goes out from the grid, and then I can switch it over and we can pick and choose which loads we want to run um, off-grid independent. And this is our Mate 3, which is very cool. This is the control center essentially for the whole unit. So we're currently producing on that top line. Well, actually, you can see the upper right batteries are currently 98%. They kind of hover between that and 100%, uh, depending on, you know, they flow, they're float charged. So, um, you know, the, the system monitors them and float charges them for a little while and then basically lets them sit there for a while, float charges them back up a little bit, keeps them up there. So we're currently producing 2.3, 2.4 kilowatts on that top line uh, from solar power right now. And again, it's early in the morning. Well, relatively, it's around 10 o'clock, 10.30. Um, we're actually, the house, that bottom line is consuming 1.3 kilowatts, 1.2. And then the middle line is how much we're either buying or selling from the utility company. We're currently selling 400 watts back to them. The array is capable of generating 7.6 kilowatts. And then in the summer, I, we're probably going to get fairly close. Obviously, you're not going to hit it exactly because you're going to get loss in your lines and loss through the inverter conversion process. Um, it's not 100% efficient, but it's usually 80-90%, somewhere in that ballpark, 85-90% efficient. And so, in the lower left, you can see, like I said, we're right now actually reducing 2.6, 2.5 kilowatts. And then that alternates every couple of seconds over to how much it's produced thus far today. And that's at 3. Point, whatever that just said. 3.2 kilowatt hours is what we've produced so far today. And you can look at the arrows on the bottom. So that shows that all that solar power is going to the right. See the right arrow? and it's going into the battery bank, which is currently at 54.3 volts. And that's then also going into the inverter. And then um, the, the last arrow is going to the right, which is the utility, which is, uh, so that means we're selling power back to the utility. And that's indicating also we've got 242 volts coming in from the utility. And then these are hot keys around it, so I can get more information on the inverter, what it's doing, the charger, the generator, the AC input. So, it's AC input it's connected to the grid. We're currently getting a 60 hertz signal, 242 volts from the utility. Let's see what the chargers are doing. Uh, inverter is basically what the inverter is doing currently. Load 1.3, output 1.4. Get more information also by clicking on these. So there's the I can switch between what's called port two and port three, and those are the two solar arrays. So one of them is producing 
9 amps and the other one's 10 amps right now. 87 and 88 volts. There's a graph, so that's kind of cool. I can see there's yesterday and then today, then production. One array and then the other array. Battery bank. You can see the voltage over time. Most of this is available through a web interface as well. And the inverter. The amount that it's inverting, and then it's currently sending zero to the batteries. It's not charging them, it's all going through in the system. The house load and then what we're selling back. See the battery status up there at the top, condition of the battery bank. And I've got more controls down here in this panel. Interact with it, program it. It's got an SD card over there, and also an Ethernet connection I've got plugged in. And then it's got its own little hub, which interconnects with all the uh, equipment. Uh, allows it to talk basically to the two inverter units and to the um, two charge controllers. And we have more surge protection devices underneath and on the side there for different things. Um, one of them is, uh, I believe that top one is utility connection uh, coming into the inverter. And then there's uh, the two for the two uh, PV arrays up top, uh, another set of surge protectors, one for the generator. And I think there's another one where it comes up from the battery bank. Pretty neat. All right, there's our new heat pump water heater. There's our tankless water heater behind it, which is still in the loop. So the, hot, the water is uh, warmed from the uh, heat pump water heater. Got it set on 125. It works very, very well. It's running right now. And then if for some reason we run out of hot water, if the tank, um, you know, lots of people take showers or whatever and drain it, then uh, this is unit's going to kick on, which I had set it. 120 so it uh, will detect that the temperature is below that and kick on those heat strips in there resistive electric heating and heat that uh, in real time as it travels through there we also have a filter as part of that system to protect it and a condensate drain and then here's our battery bank so this is our 48 volt um, almost 20 kilowatt hour uh, battery bank these are six volt batteries uh, rolls Charette is the brand. It's pretty much top of the line. They're six volt batteries, eight of them wired in series to create a total of 48 volts. And then we have our four aught um, essentially welding cable that comes down from up above and connects into this battery bank. And then I also have in parallel, there's our positive down there and our negative up there. And in parallel, I have connected this battery lifesaver desulfator unit which actually keeps the crystals from forming on the uh, battery plates inside which makes the batteries according to the reviews last uh, two to three times longer than they otherwise would so given that this uh, battery bank alone was about four thousand bucks or more um, obviously we want to extend the life of these as long as we possibly can and treat them properly not over discharge them or anything like that. That is it in a nutshell.